Hi there, it's Gabrielle Nicolet from Speech Kids where we teach little kids to talk and help parents understand their little kids. And today I'm so excited. We're gonna be talking to Tanya Wills of Manhattan Birth. Hi, Tanya. Hi. Thank you for coming. It's really fun to be here. Um, Tanya is a midwife and I'm gonna let her tell you the rest. So Tanya, who are you and what do you do? I'm Tanya Wills and I'm a midwife and I own a business called Manhattan Birth, uh, where we help people in the childbearing year. So we always say that we provide heartfelt, down-to-earth, no purple crystals, preparation and parenting support in the childbearing year. And as a midwife, I catch babies and I take care of people who are having babies. And I'm also a lactation consultant. So I help a lot of folks after they have their babies as well. Awesome. And today, I think what we agreed on is we're gonna talk sort of about that second possibly third child. Um, so there are some things that come into play when families are thinking about adding a child to the mix when they already have one. So what are, what are some of the things that you, you know, advise families on when they're having their second? Well, I would say the first thing that comes up for people um, in terms of the person who's having the baby is that they often think about, well, this is the way the birth went when I had my first kiddo. How is this next birth gonna go? And what I tell people universally is that it is not gonna go like that. It is gonna be different. I mean, the baby is gonna come out, so like that's gonna be the same. But in terms of the pattern in which uh, your labor unfolds, I mean, unless you had a scheduled cesarean and you're going to have another scheduled cesarean, but everybody knows babies do whatever they want. Sometimes people go into labor before they're scheduled cesarean. <laughs> so in any case, um, if you labored with your first, your second is going to be much shorter. And the part that is going to be shorter most of the time, most people, is going to be the hard part. Um, so if you remember, you know, pain or anything like that, um, that part is going to be much shorter, much more intense, and it's going to get the baby out quicker. So I always tell people that the average pushing time for a first baby is one to three hours, and for a subsequent baby is 15 minutes. <laughs> so true for me. Exactly like that for me. In fact, I think I went through transition and had the baby 40 minutes. Yeah, it's just like, and it's over. I almost like, didn't make happened? it to the hospital. Yes. Yeah, and people sometimes, you know, with the first baby, they always say, like, get to the hospital as late as possible. And with the second baby, I always say, you know, just get there. And if you don't want to go in yet, just walk around outside. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> because <laughs> taking care of your other children or your child, if you have a toddler, which is very common, I would say, you know, if someone is having their second child or their third child, they've still got two very young children or one young child at home, specifically if you have, if this is your second baby, it's an interesting transition because as the pregnancy progresses, what I talk with a lot of people about is what's happening inside of them as sort of saying, you know, hey, my, my little one who, you know, cracked my heart open and taught me about this type of love that I had never had for another being in my life is never going to remember when it was just the two of us. And somehow my heart is going to have to expand to fit in this baby that I have never met before. And, you know, maybe my toddler is between two and a half and four and a half, which is just like, you know, varying levels of I, I want to give the child back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So there's a, what I find is there's a, a deep desire for folks to be able to mitigate this transition in some way. They want very much not to have some permanent impact on their older children or child. They want the transition to go smoothly, um, but there are a lot of moving parts. And so what are some things that we can do short of like letting our kids pitch a fit every time they want something and can't have it or they're, you know, they're feeling stressed. And so we're just tolerating a lot of behavior. Are there some strategies that you coach parents on in terms of setting the stage for what's going to happen? I do. And I actually start specifically with the birthing parent and talking about them, about what's happening inside of them, because there mm. is a grief and a loss that they sort of experience as they're moving in to having this next child. There's not only a loss of that intimacy that they feel and that 
you know, all of the bumps that they may be going through with their toddler, they're always so close with their toddler and they're, they're in that space for when that recovery is being made. And then when the new baby comes in, I mean, some people say that going from one to two is like going from one to a hundred. So um, there's just, there's no more nap breaks. There's no more anything. It's just constant. But what I always remind uh, parents is that this is going to be an adjustment for everyone um, and that we are resilient and that your child is resilient, your toddler is resilient. They will never doubt how much you love them, but they might doubt how they are able to communicate with you. And of course, as they move into the threes and when they're really testing the limits with their parents, and now that there's a baby that is in your arms a lot of the time, these tests may go further and further because your hands are just simply not available to them the way that they used to be. But keeping in mind that both the baby and the toddler are resilient and you are going to find new ways of dealing with these things. Uh, one thing, one tip that I always give people is with their toddler, if the toddler is frustrated, if the toddler is having some sort of massive meltdown. <laughs> Which can, will happen. <laughs> oh, it. I shouldn't say if, I should say when, <laughs> because even if you don't have another baby in the mix, this is going to happen. <laughs> Developmentally appropriate. Um, and I think new parents especially want very much to take the blame mm -hmm. for any sort of behavior. Like, you know, I, I always said before I became a parent, you know, if I was in Kmart and there was, you know, a child throwing a tantrum, you know, stomping and screaming in the middle of an aisle, right? I would say, well, my, my child will never do that. I won't allow that. Mm -hmm. And then I became a parent and then I totally got it. <laughs> and then you left, like I did, left a full shopping cart. In, in my case, it was the grocery store full of groceries toddler under the arm out the door because whatever they need whatever they need yeah. whatever they need and and i think that that actually carries over quite nicely to whatever you might see with your toddler so one of the things that i always uh counsel my parents on is that if you're nursing the baby and the baby is in your arms a lot keep in mind that the baby doesn't care like the baby doesn't really need the same type of attention that somebody who's three needs. They need help navigating the world. Your newborn just needs the restaurant. You know what I mean? They need to be fed. They need to be held. They need their diaper changed. And as much as you oohed and odd and took pictures of your first or second child or all the, oh, your first baby um, with this next baby, you're going to find there's a lot less of that happening because your attention is going to be brought to the more complicated issue. And, and that is normal. I, I always share with people that when I had my second baby, I just put her in a sling and I never talked to her again. And she mm -hmm. still really loves me. <laughs> like it's yep. really yep. because her brother needed so much so one thing that I always um, remind people about is that there's always room on their lap for their first kid. So that maybe the baby is in this arm, or maybe there's times when you put the baby in the dock or whatever it is that you have, and you just say, you look, you look like you could use a hug right now. I have room right here. Do you want to hop up here? And my arm is open. Let's let me just see if that helps. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they might scream some more, but sometimes you'll see that they'll look up at you and say, yeah, I would like to scream in your arms. And then it just kind of takes everything down and you can talk about what's really happening. Mm -hmm. They're tired. They need your attention. They can't figure out something that they're doing or whatever part of the world that that particular child is having trouble navigating, which might be the fact that you didn't cut their toast correctly, but you know, whatever. These are the things. <laughs> These are the things. things. <laughs> These are the things. And I think that, you know, it's interesting because looking back on it now, I joke about how I was so codependent with my two and a half to four and a half year old. Hmm. Like if, if he was having a good day, we were having a good day. And if he was not having a good day, that belonged to me. Mm -hmm. And mm. the truth is, it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, I can be there for him and we can name, this is, a, this is a hard one that we're having today. 
but it doesn't mean that it's my fault. So I do my best to work with parents to help them understand that this balance is normal yeah. and that one day this beautiful thing happens where your toddler and your baby start playing together. Yeah. And it's like a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're really glad that you had more than one kid. Right. Uh, right. Although but, that, that time can be... <laughs> <laughs> can feel really far away. Yesterday, I yes. told I told a family that um, it might be you know a year or two, and the dad just about jumped through the screen at me. <laughs> but you know, because they start off really different, right? The difference between three and zero is a really long time. Yeah, and a two or a three year old. I mean, the baby's like a fetus to them. I mean, it's just they can't interact with them. I mean, I think a five year old does a, understands the concept of the yeah. newborn period better than a three-year-old and certainly if your older child is 18 months or two they may not acknowledge the baby at all yeah and that's, that's right. normal they may yeah. they may punch the baby yes. just to see what happens yeah and that's normal too and you know ouch that must hurt we better not hit the baby mm -hmm. i can't let you hit the baby you know yeah. um and you just explain it to them but i think some parents internalize it like oh <gasps> my toddler just hit a baby, you know, and that doesn't belong to you. That's just because they're two or they're three. Yeah. And if you wind that back, and I know you'll know what I mean, you know, they haven't been here long enough to have that mean anything other than I wanted to see what would happen if, um, and then depending on how the adults in the room react, <laughs> then one might decide, oh, I really like the way that happened or that got me what I needed, right? Mm. If, I, if I punch baby and then mom picks me up and takes me in the other room without the baby, guess what? I'm going to do that again. It works. Yeah. If mom says, oh, we can't do that. I've got, uh, as you're saying, baby on one side, come sit over here and I'm going to show you a, a different way, a better way mm -hmm. to get my attention. Mm -hmm. Then that's going to, we'll go down the primrose path that way. And that's usually, I think, what's at play is that the kiddo knows there's something distracting from the attention that they're getting, and they don't know how to navigate around yeah. it. So they're just trying stuff. Right. And if your child, I'm going to jump in here again, if your child has a speech and language disorder, which many of the families who, you know, who work with us and who follow us do, um, then, then that's compounded too, because they're already not understand. They're understanding emotional subtext much of the time most kids are, no matter how impaired they are. <laughs> but then they're also not necessarily understanding the words. And so it's confusing emotionally. And then if they don't have the language skills on top of that, then they're really unmoored. Um, and so, you know, all of these examples that you're giving, I want you to talk a little bit about partners, because we've been talking about the birthing yeah. parent. Um, yeah. What about the non-birthing parent? You know, I would say for the non-birthing parent, for the partner, I mean, this is bumpy for them as well because they're sort of replaying this whole thing that maybe they've seen before only maybe they remember the first time that their partner had trouble in the immediate postpartum period it was emotional maybe they were nursing issues maybe they were bleeding nipples and all of you know all the things don't forget you cry on day three don't forget that guys <laughs> Everybody cries on day three. Everybody in the and house. Sometimes on four, five, six, and seven. <laughs> right there in that, in that, from day, that whole solid week from day three. Um, so don't forget all of that. But I would say, again, this working as a team with your partner and with your toddler, and keep in mind that the baby doesn't need much. So if it's holding the baby, if it's passing the baby, if it's um, reading to the toddler, if it's being with the toddler if it's telling the toddler that they need to wait it's hard to wait but you're going to need to wait mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know these kinds of things whatever it is just being there to support and if you're a partner sometimes partners i mean it's now with covid i mean it's actually kind of a very nice time to have a baby right now because everyone's home yeah. um so like uh, there's a lot of co-parenting going on that has, is much more natural than it than it used to be. But if you are a partner that is not the primary caregiver of the children, you come home later in the day, you sort of see them for bedtime and you have weekends, sometimes those partners can feel like they're invading the primary parent's mm. territory. They feel like this is really her thing. She really has a way with all of the kids, so I'm going to stay out of the way. And so mm -hmm. having the partner or the other parent home all of the time now is a disruption in the toddler's life as well. Having visitors come over to see the baby, these are all disruptions. And so one of the things that the partner can do is really 
get in there, make a plan with your, with the person who's birthing the baby, make a plan together about like, how, how can I assist with time with our toddler, time with the baby, so you don't feel like you're caring for everyone and me. I know that you've got healing to do, that you've got hormones that need to heal. What is our plan for in the morning, I take the baby, or in the afternoon, I take the baby and you're with the toddler or whatever it is, and come up with some little plans for ways that you are going to take the reins and say, I know this is different from the way that, that she does it, but this is my way and this is the way that it's going to be right now, you know, and explain to the toddler how things are going to be a little bit more disrupted. I, I don't know that it's going to stop them from feeling disrupted, but it might help you feel like you understand what's going on and it's not complete chaos. So yeah. planning can really help. And then the last thing I would say is that for the partner, um, exercising boundaries with people that want to come and see the baby mm. and make sure that you don't have like everybody that was on your wedding list come. Like <laughs> it's not a steady a, parade. <laughs> you, you know, because that means everyone is going to feel like they need to be showered and that there needs to be cheese and crackers out. Not everyone who comes to visit is going to understand what a huge adjustment this is for your family. If you do have close people that are coming, one recommendation that I always say is tell them to speak to the, to the older children first. Yeah. What's going on with you? Is that your train? Do you want to show it to me? Because the truth is like the baby doesn't care. Mm -hmm. Only the toddler cares that somebody is over. Yeah. <laughs> so there will be a time for them to see the baby. Don't even ask about the brother or sister. If the older sibling says, I got a new baby. Oh, you did. You got a new baby. Okay, great. Can you show it to me? What is it? Is it a boy baby? Is it a girl? What is it? You know, um, is it a brother? Um, then they can get interested in the baby. But I think the inundation of the baby being the number one thing for a child that isn't ready to take that on just yet, um, I think is, is a bit much. So really asking folks, just as soon as you get here, spend some time with the kids you already know, we promise you'll get to hold the baby. I think sometimes parents are, are fearful that if they don't, how do I want to say this? If they don't make it about the baby and, and, and don't try to make the older sibling understand that somehow there's going to be a missed opportunity. And I guess, I mean, obviously I have an opinion about this, which is it's not going to happen. The baby's going to live there for a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, at some point, there, there's a stage there too where it's like, can we send this back? Oh, there no, is. we Let really. Oh, grandma and grandpa are coming. Are they taking the baby with them to their house? I've heard that. No, the baby's staying here. Like, oh. Forever. <laughs> really? Because that's not what I signed up for. So I, you know, I want you to sort of allay the fears of parents who think, like, well, don't they have to accept it? Uh, yeah, they do. But like. I mean, they will, right? Because I think that. One of the things that I certainly have learned as a parent, but especially because I hang out with a lot of new families, like brand spanking new families that are going through massive transitions like this. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I know about kids is that they're growing. Babies are growing, toddlers are growing, older siblings are growing, and, as, and, and the parents are growing, right? And as we grow together under the same roof, making it a safe place for us all to be, uh, with the knowledge that like, these are the folks who are going to give me sort of the, the, the container in which my life exists. Mm -hmm. I may not like certain things in these containers, but I know in this container, but I know that with this family, it's all going to get sorted out and it does. So even if, you know, you have a, you know, a child who says, I want the baby to go with grandma and not come back, or I really, I don't, like the baby or punches the baby every time they see the baby and you're like, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> um, you deal with it and you remember that all of us have resilience. The child has resilience. They're going to grow and they are going to understand. And then one day they will play together and you'll say, I never thought it would happen. And now they're siblings, which of course has eventually their own issues, but um, they will start 
uh, involving each other in each other's lives. And certainly for the baby, uh, what I do find universally is that if there's an older sibling, that is the number one person in their eye level that they're going to start watching. As soon as they get a little bit older and start yeah. tracking, they track that sibling before they start tracking the parents as soon as they find them. So um, it's a really, really interesting thing. But that's what I would say, not to focus on prevention of family members having the emotion, right? but to focus on how do we organize ourselves as adults to be able to attend to the emotional needs of the folks in the family that need help, of the little ones that need help with the adjustment, it doesn't mean that we can fix it for them. We may not fix it for them, but they will know that we are here to assist them through this process. Yeah. yeah. And then the other thing I always like to add here is to your point about eventually they're gonna play together, right? This is with any, with any luck, close to an 80 to 100 year life at this point, right? <laughs> where your kids are going to be siblings for 80 to 100 years. <laughs> so, you know, if, if for these two, they're not the best of friends, it's okay. They've, and, and literally, they're, they're going to have that relationship for the rest of their lives. And so when we set it up, the way that you're describing, we're good to go. That's going to marinate and do its own thing in time. We accept each of them. And I think one last thing I would add is to be curious about discovering kind of who you got. You know, who, oh, you are so speaking my language right now. <laughs> That's, that is what we do. That is Let's exactly see who you got. What we do. Who did you get here? Who, who is, you who brought this, get? okay, this is crazy. <laughs> we bring people home, into our homes. We say, we sight unseen. <laughs> we say, sure, come live in my house for 18 to 20 whatever years. Who does that? That's insane. It's insane. It really is. But see kind of who you got. And, and this is who I have right now. And let's see who they're becoming. Because that's the other thing is that, you know, they go through these developmental phases and they are, you know, who are we raising? We're, we're raising adults, right? And when they're, when they're young, they're kids and they, they are who they are. But we are that, that constant influence in their life in their lives as they become adults so as they go through all the trials and tribulations of you know toddlerhood where you want to give them away and then all of a sudden they're five and they're smiling or whatever it is like all of those things mm -hmm. um that you are associated with the, the good and the bad and and they have seen their own ability to make it through difficult yeah. times and the thing is there's gonna there's gonna be more Yep. You know, yep. this is only the beginning. <laughs> yeah. And it's all, it's all good. It's all good. It's beautiful. Tanya, thank beautiful. you so much. For My being here. pleasure. Thank it's you for fun. having me. All right. If people want to find out more about you, where can they do that? They can do that at manhattanbirth.com or tanyawells.com. Perfect. All right. Take care. Take care.